Hey, uh, let's begin this morning in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask for our hearts to be ready to experience your word, to understand its truth, and to let the truth uh, change us into who you want us to be. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen. All right, 21 years ago, right? 21 years ago, it was 2003, and I was in this class that was a requirement in order to graduate. And I was in this class, and I did such a good job that they gave me an F for fantastic, okay? (laughs) They asked me to take it again the next year. And so I go back into that class the next year, and I walk in, and of course, I, you know, I thought I was so cool. Here I am a senior in a class full of juniors, and uh, I end up locking eyes with this tiny-headed little girl across the room, and I just, I, I didn't know what it was, but I was just so enthralled by who she was, just what, who, what she looked like, okay? I was, you know, just so taken aback that I even leaned over to a friend of mine, his name's Carson, I re- leaned over to him and I said, Carson, I don't know what it is, dude, but I just can't th- stop thinking about her, okay? And it was right about then that I stopped thinking about her, and I started thinking about who's buying beer for Friday night, okay? That's what I was thinking. And fast forward, you know, she goes off to college and I go off to the military about five years later after, you know, two tours in Iraq and, you know, after many, many debaucherous nights and a lot of mistakes and nights out out of the town, I'm living in Germany and all of a sudden I'm on the internet and I see this, the, the name of this tiny headed little girl from back in high school Miss Stephanie Forge, her name little boop, on Facebook, Facebook Messenger. And I was like, okay, this is my chance, okay? This is my chance to tell her that I've always been thinking about her and I just can't believe it, right? And so I started, I, you know, I started thinking, I'm like, well, what am I going to say? I can't just, you know, jump out here. So I started thinking about what I wanted to write and, you know, I, 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 it came to me finally, came to me. And I thought, oh, okay, that's good. Right, that's good, right? It was something that I was thinking about. I'm like, yeah, she's really going to like that, right? It was, it was really profound. It was really, you know, I thought it was even poetic, okay? It was astounding, awe-inspiring, and I took my, my chubby little fingers, and I started typing out, hunting and pecking, and I was like, oh, she's really going to like this. You want to know what it was? Hey, girl. <laughs> so romantic, right? So romantic. That was the beginning of the future Mrs. Welch's best life, okay? (laughs) She didn't know it, but the Lord had given me as a gift for her, okay? And after a year and a half or so, you know, short term, you know, short distance and long distance, you know, dating, uh, I had to go back to Afghanistan for a year and she stuck through it. She stuck with it. And I realized that a girl that can, that can stay with me as weird as I am and last throughout the, the deployment, that she was, she was really something special. And I realized that God, I was not the gift to Stephanie. God sent Stephanie as a gift to me. So I I wifed her up real quick, okay? I put a ring on it, and on August 1st, 2011, me and Miss Stephanie Ford standing proudly in the Visalia courthouse in, in front of a judge, we professed our love and our vows together, and we, you know, uh, we vowed to love each other till death do us part, and just like every Disney movie we had ever seen, it was going to be happily ever after. At least that's what we thought. As happy as we were that day, like many marriages right across the country, the happiness eventually wore off. And we were left kind of staring at each other, not really knowing what to do, how to be a couple, how to be married. I didn't have a good example. Stephanie had a great example, but that was just what she was used to. I had my, you know, I, I, my parents divorced when I was three. Her parents are still together after 40 years. My dad, married countless times, dated I couldn't tell you how many women. Her dad faithfully stood by one woman for the last 40 years in a godly way. I didn't have siblings really growing up. I have a half-sister, but she was 
She was 17 years old and when I was born, so she was already out of the house. I didn't understand how family dynamics worked. Uh, Stephanie, she was blessed enough to have two brothers to teach her how to love annoying people, right? That was, that was a blessing for her. I moved all across Central Valley. I, I went to 11 different schools before high school. Stephanie went to the same school district her entire life, and her parents still live in the exact same home that they, that they moved to some, what is it, 33, 34 years. We had two very different experiences of what marriage looked like, and yet neither one of us knew what to do. We were two young lovers that had no idea how to authentically love each other. Thousands of marriages have no idea how to authentically love each other. In this country, people, you, you see it on TV, you see it all over the place. You know, one of the number one websites on the internet is called thenot.com. And it, people are more excited about preparing for a wedding than they are preparing for a marriage. In the last four years, I have done 33 weddings. Only four of those have ever approached me to ask, hey, how, how can we be godly, a godly couple? How can, we be, how can I be a godly wife? How can I be a godly husband? Most people just ask me where to stand, what to say, when to say it, right? what move to make, right? when do we do this, when do we do that, when do we walk? We have no training for our marriage. We really don't. We just kind of get the marriage license and move on. But, you know, with, with such an important decision in our life, I think it would be really important for us to have some training first. Like, would you allow a 16-year-old to just be given their license and to just go and learn how to drive afterwards? No. Would you let somebody do that with your taxes? They just get their tax license, that they can be a tax preparer, and then just give them, like, here's all my financial documents. Do with it what you will. Would you do that? Of course not. Surgeon comes into the surgery room. God is, God is you know, uh, MD from a Cracker Jack box. Got his license without any training. He's using you as the dummy. Would you want that? Of course not. Then why do we allow no training uh, with our marriages? One of the most important decisions of your life. We, we have no thought of what companionship is. We're more prepared in marriage to be lovers than we are with being lifers. When, cu when couples talk to me and they get all excited and, and they'll tell me, like, oh, Pastor Dave, we have, we're so in love, we've never even had a fight, okay? Never even fought. And I said, well, guess what? Y'all need to go get in a fight right now or else you're not ready for marriage, you need to learn how to, how to walk through these disagreements. You need to learn how to live life with people. And, you know, it, you, you have no idea what it means to love or live life with someone until you experience them in some of the most vulnerable moments, right? We don't, we don't think about when we're young, we don't think about what it means to have physical needs or financial needs or to talk about what parenting is going to look like or, or, or do we want to be parents? Do we want to buy a house? What kind of things do we want in the future? Let alone talk about our own spiritual responsibilities or needs. We get our marriage license and without any training, we just get this paper and we think, eh, we'll figure it out. It'll be fine. Stephanie and I did the same thing. We got our license, and we just said, we'll figure it out. The reason most people, actually, let me back up, we never thought about what it would mean to actually live together as a couple. We, I, I had no idea how much this woman snored at night. No idea. We almost got a divorce early in our marriage because we went into it thinking, well, I guess we're just going to figure it out. And the reason we almost got a divorce is because I didn't understand what it meant to be a God-honoring husband. I didn't know my role as a husband. I didn't know my role as a partner, what my role was even as a man. All I knew was that when I was with her, she made me happy. That's all I cared about. 
And then when the happiness started to wane, right, the honeymoon period wore off, the puppy love was gone, I had no idea what to do next. So I just thought, well, she doesn't make me happy anymore, better go find someone that does. That's what I thought. How many of you are married right now? How many of you are married? Is marriage happily ever after? Why is it the men giggling right now? Okay. <laughs> marriage is not happily ever after. It never is. And that's okay. Right? That's okay. Because we're not destined to be happy in marriage. We're destined to be joyful in marriage. Happiness is in circumstance, right? Joy is, is in choice. I am happy when my recliner works and uh, the game is on, right? I'm happy then. Joy is intentional. Happiness is circumstantial. Joy is when. Happiness is if then. James chapter 1, verse 2, my dear family, when you find yourselves tumbling into various trials and tribulations, learn to look at it with total joy. He said, when you find yourselves, because bad times are not an if, they're a when. Bad times are, are a guarantee in this life, and if we think marriage is somehow immune to this, we're just, we're not being, we're not living in truth. We're not living an authentic marriage. We have no idea what it truly means to be a biblical couple, to be authentically married. Listen to what the dictionary says marriage is. You ready? Oxford Dictionary, one of the most, you know, uh, um, uh, recognized dictionaries. It says, the l marriage is the legally or formally recognized union of two people as partners in a personal relationship. Cornell Law, Univers uh, uh, Law School defines it very similarly. It's the legal union of individuals with characteristics like the party's legal ability to marry each other, mutual consent of the parties. That's pretty good. I think that's important. But here's the last part. A marriage contract as required by law. The culture views marriage as a contract. And unfortunately, the church is walking its way there too. Not the institution, but the people. Thinking that love, thinking that companionship, thinking that God-ordained marriage is somehow just as easy as, as, as a contract between you know, two where we're going to love, we're going to cherish, we're going to have and hold until death do us part. When really, it's when happiness wanes. I know this. Because the number one reason that is listed for divorce in the United States is happiness. It's listed way more than anything else. Of course, there are a lot of other reasons. We're going to get into a few legitimate ones that God's okay with, but everything from finances to stinky feet are listed as a reason to divorce. Because in a contract, when I don't receive what I was told I'm going to receive, I'm no longer bound to those, uh, to those terms. Covenants are not that way. God does not see marriage that way. God has never seen marriage that way. And God will never see marriage the way that the culture does because the world sees marriage as a contract, but the Word sees it as a covenant. They're very different. If you're here today and you're not married... Okay? I need you to pay attention. If, you, if, if, if you've been, if you're here, you've been married, maybe you've been divorced, I really need you to listen up because the, statistically the rate of divorce amongst second and third marriages become as high as 78% guarantee you are going to get a divorce again. Okay? You need to pay attention because as long as your eyes are on Christ, right? You can reduce your chances of becoming another statistic. And if you are married, I need you to listen as well because Forbes reports, okay? This was a statistical study that Forbes sponsored, and they found that evangelical Christians have the highest divorce rate amongst all religions in the entire world. Evangelical Christians have the highest divorce rates amongst any religion of the entire world. And this trend has got to stop. It's got to stop. And it stops when we start to understand God's definition of marriage. And I've already said it. Authentic marriage is not built with a contract. It's built in a covenant. What's the difference? Well, 
A contract is a piece of paper, right, between two companies, two institutions. Often it's called uh, business to business, and they happen every day. These, this business guarantees this action, you know, to this business. If these parameters are kept, contracts do not require people. They can be independent of, of relations. It, they, they can just be institutional for legitimacy. Contracts are institutional. Covenants, however, require people because they're relational. Every single major promise that God made with His people, every single one of them, was in covenant. Every important connection God made was in this promise to love far greater because it was in relation to each other. The Noahic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, the new covenant, these were all meant to be bonds between God and His people. We see in Judges chapter 2, verse 1, I, the Lord said, I brought you out, out of Egypt and led you into the land I swore to give to your ancestors. I said, I will never break my covenant with you. This is an important piece. Like I said, I did a lot of marriages. And when men, when men and women are up there at the altar, right, they usually end with their vows with, I do. I think we need to change that. I think couples need to end their vows with, I will never break my covenant with you. It's not just a promise. This is about being bound together. They're stronger they're, than a contract. They're relationally bound, right? Like really bonded uh, together. You know what another word for bond is in the Bible? Cleave. Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife. Cleave means bond. The two most important words in that passage, leave and cleave. Authentic marriages learn to leave and cleave, okay? When I got out of the service, Stephanie and I, we were, you know, just kind of getting started. Uh, she had just graduated college. I had just got on the service. We didn't really have jobs. We weren't even really good adults yet, uh, and we didn't have a lot of options. We're very grateful for the option that we did have, but it was move in with her mom and dad, okay? Let me tell you, that was a hot mess. Freshly married couple moving in with her parents. You know, if it was just us, maybe we could figure that out. But not only was it us, it was also her little brother, okay? Not bad yet, until her older brother moved in with his wife and his daughter. Eight people, one house. Wow. You, you, you better believe, if, you know, we got along great, let me tell you. Never had any arguments, never had any problems. Do you sense the sarcasm, Okay. It was, it was a very unique situation. There's a reason the Lord said that we need to leave our mother and fathers when we get married because you cannot fulfill your duties as a husband or as a wife when you're still connected to your parents. Living with them or not, not let it, leaving your parents will give you very mixed priorities in your marriage. Guys still connected to their moms. They never truly learn how to, how to trust their wives. They never become companions. They never become dependent on each other. They'll let mom just come in and butt into the marriage every time there's an opportunity. Girls connected with their dads do things similar. They'll say, well, my dad doesn't do, that, do it that way. Well, we really need to call my dad. He knows what to do, right? We need to call my dad. Does that sound like trust or companionship? Of course not. That sounds like two that have not learned to become adults on their own. And if you're a mom or a dad that cannot let go of your kids, you are literally the cause of sin in their life. I'm telling you that right now. I know it's hard to see them move on, go into these new stages of life, but your purpose is not to keep them as little babies and little children. Your purpose is to raise them up in the manner of God and kick them out into the world that's your responsibility, to create men and women of God. You don't have to like it, right? 
But you do have to obey Christ. And he reiterated in Matthew 19, 5, and Jesus said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. Okay? A man is, is, is we can talk about that later, but this really is talking about both couples. And if you have not cut that umbilical cord as a parent, it, you cannot obey Christ. Same as a couple, if you have not cut that, you, it's not just that you leave your partner, you, if you don't cut that umbilical cord, you cannot do the next part, which is cleave to your spouse, bond with that spouse. It's not a suggestion. It's not some new mode or method of marriage. It is a command. It is a command from the divine God himself. Cleave is one of those words that when we really think about it at first, it kind of sounds like, you know, maybe a negative that's because it has two meanings. One, cleave, means to separate, but it also means to join. In the Hebrew, that's just how it works out. It means both to sever and to join. And in this context, cleave means to join into one another as a tight bond. Now, of course, you remain as two distinct individuals created for a unique purpose. You're still, you know, yourselves, but together you've been created for something far greater. And that can only be accomplished as a new and totally distinct being. Genesis 2, 24, right? It says, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be cleaved to his wife and ready for this, and the two will become one flesh. That word flesh that Jesus used is sark, S-A-R-X, really, but we use a C. And it means whole body. It means blood. It means the bones and the flesh all put together. It's the wholeness of one's being, right? We, that's where we get the word sarcophagus, where they put the whole body into this big old box. That's what the Egyptians called it, sarcophagus. And so that it, or they didn't call it that. We call it that, but that's what it is. And the Bible says that the two will become one flesh. This isn't about procreation. This is not about two becoming one flesh in the idea of children. This is talking about two becoming one flesh, becoming whole again. What I'm about to say might contradict a lot of teaching that you have had, a lot of Bible translations. They, they translate it, you know, really well, but it kind of gives this wrong image. Eve was not made from Adam's rib, his literal rib, his, out of his rib cage. I know it's often translated like that, but in Hebrew, the words that it was written in, right, the, the message that God wanted to portray was not a rib of a rib cage, it was a side. You know how we know this? Because the exact same word is used when the, when the uh, uh, Israelites were des uh, describing the side of a piece of wood. It was the same word used when they were talking about the side of Noah's ark, right? It's the, it, that's what it means. Eve was built... She was constructed from Adam's side. An entire portion of Adam is removed to create woman. We see this, Genesis 2, verses 21 through 23. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was asleep, he took part of the man's side, closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the part that he had taken out of the man, and then it brought her to the man. The man said, this one at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one will be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And you ready for this? Very next verse, verse 24, okay? She was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is cleaved and united to his wife, and they become one flesh. What was once separated is now joined. They become one because they were meant to be as one. What was separated becomes unified. What was partial becomes whole. If you're blessed enough to, stay, to be single, okay, Paul says, stay single. But if you are you know, married, uh, if that's God's plan for you to marry, it's not about a ceremony, it's not about a wedding, it's about the bonding of two unique bodies into a new creation. It means what one does, the other one's affected by it. What happens to the wife 
is shared by the husband. What the husband endures, so the wife does also. And we know this, that, that the sexes, the men and women, they don't process those, those experiences the same way. Men handle things very different than women do, and that's okay. That's how God designed it. It should be a unification of parts that eventually become a whole. What one lacks, the other picks up for. I am the spender in the house. Stephanie is the saver, right? If there were two spenders in the house, we wouldn't have a house. We'd be out on the streets. We've got to have a balance, right? If we had two savers in the house, yeah, we'd have a house, but we definitely wouldn't have a lifestyle. We wouldn't be able to do the things we do. It takes both perspectives. It takes partnership. It takes, it takes this, you know, commitment to, to being together and finding those, those, those grounds of compromise. There's no relationship. I know, I know it gets said a lot. There's no relationship that is truly 50-50, though. It does, this, no decision, no marriage is made up of complete equality because somebody is always giving up something more than the other. Somebody is, you know, uh, doing more than the other. And when push comes to shove, somebody always has to take more responsibility than the other. There's no equality amongst the sexes. There are some things that a woman is straight up better at than a man, and no matter how you shake it, there are things that men are better at than a woman. We see that in today's sports. Oh, man, I can't believe I just said that. Um, I need a filter. Uh, (laughs) And each are responsible for those things, okay? Authentic marriages have responsibilities, and this is them to love and to respect. We see this in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 33. Each one of you also must love his wife. He's talking to the men as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Man is to love his wife and the wife to respect her husband. Successful marriages take responsibility, right, for their part in the relationship. The husband is responsible to love and the wife is responsible to respect. Women think differently. They have different needs, right? They think more with their heart. Men think more with their, with their head, Women want their arms and back stroked. Men want their egos stroked. It's different. The things that we need, the things that we we desire. If we are to love as men, we need to know that the number one way that we can love our wives, the number one way that you can love your wife is by giving her the most expensive thing that you will ever own. It's not a house. It's not a car. Okay? It's not money in the bank. The most expensive thing that you could ever give your spouse is your time. Men get wrapped up in tasks. Okay? Eat, work, come home, go to sleep, repeat. Right? Men have this like just this this constant thought of just like, I are man, I go work, I eat, I sleep, go back work. Okay? We're very simple creatures. Very simple. What your wife really wants, though, is not the, you know, not the, the provisions. Yes, those are important. Not, the, not all this other stuff. What she wants is your time. And so that means paying attention to her, coming up to her when you come home and saying, Hi, honey, I've missed you all day. Okay? Coming home and sitting with her. Maybe, you know, before you actually, you know, do anything else, it means to take initiative around the house. It means complimenting her more than just on Valentine's Day. It means actually listening to her, not hearing her. Hearing is just experiencing sound. Listening is experiencing a relationship. You want to listen to her talk about her day without somehow trying to weasel your way out of the conversation or just try to think about problem solving. That's what men like to do, problem solve when people are talking. That's not what she wants because listening shows compassion. Listening shows care. Listening shows that you love her. And it's not an option. It's literally your responsibility as a biblical man to love your wife as Christ has loved the church. He gave his life for it. Men that give their li- over their lives, they choose their wives over their hobbies. 
Men that choose to give their lives over to their wives choose their wife over family and friends. They end up choosing their wife over everything and anything else in this world. And that means to truly love your wife, you have to give her your time. Some people might say, you know, well, I'm always at work because I do love my family. I want to provide for them. I want to give them a good life. I'm sorry to say, but men that speak that way love accomplishment more than they love their families. They love achievement. And when they achieve status and reward, they feel complete. And I know that this has been the view of many generations, but at the end of life, I have done many funerals and I've been at the bedside of many people who are transitioning into heaven and not a single one has said, man, I really wish I would have finished that project at work. Not a single one. Yet everyone says they wish they had another minute to be with their family. Time is the key to love men. That is your responsibility. That is your key. And often men work in their career, you know, more than they work on their marriage. They often do that is because they feel more respected at work than they do at home. Ladies, that's, that's, that's critical. Your responsibility is to respect your man. He needs acknowledgement. He needs to be, you know, acknowledged for his hard work for the family. It means to acknowledge his contributions. It means, you know, because men, they, they need to feel respected. It shows trust. It shows that, you know, the uh, belief in their abilities. It shows that you care about him living to his potential. Think about it. Why in the world... Would a man love in a place where he's not respected or appreciated? Why would he do that? Flip side, why would a woman respect a man where there's no love? This is your responsibilities because we're each responsible to one another. The Bible is very clear on that. But when it comes to marriage, men are responsible for one another. How do I know this? Because when Eve ate the apple and God came down after they hid from him, who did he call out for? Did he say, Eve, get your butt over here? No. Did he say, you two come here right now? God didn't say that. You know what he said? Adam, where are you? Okay, that's my best God voice. Adam was held responsible for what Eve did. Even though Adam tried to pawn it off, he was like, no, 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 it wasn't me. It was her. She did it. It was her it was here to her choice. God said, I don't care. You are the one that's in charge. You are the one that's responsible for what happened. Same is expected of you men today. You're responsible for the safety, security, and sustainment of your household, of your marriage. Think about it. Whether you like it or not, if a family cannot pay their bills, if, they, if they're dealing with you know, financial stress, who is always looked at as the one that is responsible for trying to fix that? The man. If a, if a burglar is coming and trying to break their way into the house, who's the one expected to defend the house? The man. I mean, my wife does it more often than I do. I'm pretty asleep. When the kids act out or get in trouble, who's expected to be the top authority? When dad gets home, you're done, right? Just you wait till dad gets here. We all know it's mom, but, you know, we say that. (laughs) You know what men are also responsible for? Men, you are responsible for the safety, the security, and the sustainment of your home, but also the spirituality of your family. The most important action you could ever do for your wife is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength, your body, everything that you are. Because how you love your wife is directly linked to how you love God. How you serve your wife is directly linked to how you serve the Lord. How you lead your home is directly linked to how you submit to Christ. Ladies, Empowerment, 
Go do whatever you'd like to do. Have the career. Be the breadwinner of the home. Take on any authority that you want in the home. But leave the spirituality to the men. And men, you need to step up into that role. That is your job, not anyone else's. And yet, churches are filled with 70% women every year. Men don't want to take responsibility for, the, for their role within the home. This is this, what this means. This means that our men need to lead in prayer in the house. Need to lead in discipleship in the house. This means to lead kids in love, in the love of Christ. This means being the best example of Jesus that you can be to you, to your entire family. Let me tell you what it's not. Husbands, being the spiritual leader of your house is not using verses to get what you want, like saying, wives need to submit to their husbands and ignoring the part where you need to submit your life to Christ. You don't get to call out Scripture that you like until your wife sees you submitting to the Lord. Period. If you don't know how Christ loves, if you don't know what it means to sacrificially love as Jesus does, then you don't get to hold your wife to a standard that you're not living yourself. If you don't learn what to submit to the Lord, you do not deserve a wife that's going to submit to you. You get it? Love and respect. Love to get respected, respect to get loved. And there's lots of topics that we could really talk about in marriage. Lots of things, right? I could spend hours of that, or, you know, on this. But what happens when husbands and wives don't hold up to their responsibilities? You know what happens? Conflict. Conflict happens in the marriage when one is not loving and one is not respecting. It happens all the time. Conflict's good. In, in, in small doses, right? You learn how other people operate. You learn how one another love. You learn how, how, how all to, to love the person, right? Because it's a covenant. You're not going to break up just because you don't agree on which side the toilet paper is supposed to be on. You're not going to do that. You're going to forgive. You're going to forget. You're going you're gonna to work on you know, mercy. You're going to look on reconciliation. You're going to work on the, the health of your marriage, it's a covenant. You're going to have to give and take. It's all about that, right? It's not a contract where if somebody messes up, all of a sudden it's broken. Marriages are covenants. They need to be worked on. But sometimes, sometimes, the covenants are not fulfilled so, so much that one side is doing it all and the other side is not living up to absolutely anything, covenants become broken in such a way that it is impossible to work through. Even the most authentic marriage can sometimes face an impasse. It happens, okay? It's happened to some of you. Where divorce is the only answer. And unfortunately, it's a very difficult answer. One that God even knows himself. See, one of the ways that God describes his relationship with his people is he is the husband and we are his bride. He is our groom. We, we are his you know, wife providing for us. He provides. He protects us. We see in Isaiah, for your maker is your husband. The Lord Almighty is his name. We see in Jeremiah, not like the covenant, this is the Lord talking, that I made with their fathers, my covenant that they broke while I was their husband. And the covenant that they broke, that the Israelites broke, uh, was a covenant of fidelity. This is a covenant of fidelity. The Lord said, you shall have no other gods before me. And what did the Israelites do? Every single time you turn around, they would get bored with God and they'd move on to whatever else sounded cool. Did it all the time. There's an entire book called Judges. You read it. It's weird. The Israelites constantly would worship the gods of the land. And it happened so often that God even describes them as an unfaithful spouse. Jeremiah 3.8, I gave faithless Israel her certificate of divorce and sent her away because of all of her adulteries. It happens. 
I know there are many good and faithful Christians that believe that all divorce is sinful. And in most cases, I would agree with them. Like when couples divorce because they just give up in the relationship. But there are legitimate reasons some marriages end. And the most common is what happened to God and Israel. Infidelity. And I know it's a nasty word, and many marriages, you know, they start out swearing purity to each other, and yet they still end with this, with this unfortunate experience of adultery. No marriage, not a single marriage. I don't care how holy you are. I don't care how righteous you think you are. I don't care how protected you are. Not a single marriage on this planet is safe from the temptation of adultery, Okay? Even God's marriage with Israel, God himself, creator of the universe, all-knowing, all-seeing, all-strong, right? He, he was unable to save the Israelites from infidelity. Being a Christian does not save you from that. Pastors have affairs. Elders and deacons, they cheat on their spouses. Male and female Christians from all walks of life, they fall into this temptation. It happens every day in this country, and every marriage that chooses to end in divorce because of it total agreement with God. But I just want to point out that even though moral failures are total valid reasons to end a, a covenant with one another, to end a, a marriage, total valid reason for separation, you need to understand that mercy is still a choice, it's still an option. How do we know this? Because God himself said, go proclaim the message to the north. Return, faithless Israel, declares the Lord. I will frown on you no longer, for I am faithful. I will not be angry forever. He had mercy on Israel. He desired their return. He wanted to maintain that covenant, that relationship. He was the one that was faithful, and he was still willing to work on things. Mercy is still an option. I know, even though it's a terrible situation, and if you're somebody right now that's struggling with that, that's with faithfulness, you need to come and see me. You're not, this isn't, a, this isn't about being in trouble. It's, it's, it's not going to be easy, but you got to take care of what's going on. You got to come clean sooner than later. And if you think that the church isn't somewhere where you can confess your sins, I think we've got it wrong about church. This is somewhere that I, I believe you should be able to share things like that and actually begin a process of, hear, uh, of healing. You know, of course, there, there are some things that we can do to save a marriage, that even that the ones that have been tainted by infidelity. But you need to understand, it involves extreme repentance, extreme renewal, right? There's no guarantee, but there are things that can be done. There's another valid reason. Even authentic marriages can end in divorce and that is because of abuse, okay? Let me be clear. No one has the right to abuse anyone. Not physically, not emotionally, not psychologically, not sexually, not in abandonment, not in neglect. Abuse has zero excuse, zero. Sternness with one another, fine. Guidance, sure. Correction, I'm fine with that. That's not unbiblical behavior. But abuse is an incredibly difficult sin. If you don't know the difference, this is what it is. The cons uh, uh, abuse is the con uh, consistent domination of another through intentional violence or aggression. It's a very serious sin. I don't need to go into any more detail about what it is, but I will say that you do not ever, 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 ever have to feel guilty about leaving a, an abusive partner, you know, about separating from an abusive partner, to find help, to get help, to, to put that stuff out into the open, to divorce that abusive person. You have never should feel guilty, ever, ever, ever. Too many partners think that, well, if I, you know, if I leave, then, then you know, it's going to hurt them. They're not going to be able to support themselves. Well, if I leave, then you know, they'll never be able to change. I know their heart. They can change. It'll be better. No, it's not going to get better. Never, ever, ever let someone consistently put you down like that, uh, force you sexually or physically assault you. Psalm 11, verse 5, the Lord examines the righteous but the wicked 
Those that love violence. Ready for this? He, God, hates with a passion. He hates those that love violence. How would you like to be on the other side of God? Not his love, but his hatred, his wrath. That sounds awful. And there are 18 other verses condemning abuse. God hates that kind of behavior. Yeah, if you know your Bible well and you go into the Old Testament, there are passages that are kind of difficult, but those are not abuse. That's not a license for that. Those are consequences. There are no, there's no rabbinical or historical evidence that those consequences were even carried out, but even if they were, they are not normative. It's not something that is excusable. Abuse is the consistent domination, not, not consequence, but domination of another through intentional violence or aggression, and there has never been or ever will be an excuse for that, period. Just as with sexual immorality, there are consequences, yes, but here's the deal. If you are somebody that struggles with anger, if you are partnered with somebody that struggles with anger, there can be renewal and restoration for that person. I'm not saying to preserve the marriage. You've lost that right as an abuser. You don't get to have the marriage anymore. That's gone, okay? But we can work on your, your experience with the Lord. We can prevent your eternal separation from God. You don't want to be on the side of hatred with Him. You want to be on His love, okay? And we can work on that. Those are the only two biblically sanctioned reasons for, for divorce. Abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, psychological, neglect, right? Abandonment, and sexual immorality. I know it's a very touchy subject, but I need you to know what it means to follow God's will. Every other reason for divorce is a sin. It's just the way it is. But do you know what's stronger than sin? mercy and grace. The mercy of God can take any situation and work it for good for those that love him. We all make mistakes. We all sin. It happens. But the grace of God is bigger. Authentic marriage is about perseverance, not perfection. Every one of us has the ability to sin, to make mistakes, to even quit, but only a few know what it's like, right, to keep going. Only a few know what it means to preserve through tough times, right? Only a few have even seen the rewards of that, of perseverance. After, an, after Adam and Eve were, you know, got in trouble, they got kicked out of Eden, right? They were punished, they were kicked from the home, they had nothing to take with them, they had no clothes, they had no car to put it all in, they had no furniture, they had no apartment that they could move to, they had nothing, absolutely nothing. We don't see that they bickered at each other, that they complained at each other, they didn't, they didn't separate, they didn't, they, they didn't uh, resent each other. Hold on till the kids were old enough. No, they continued as companions and they enjoyed the blessing of God for their de determination. The blessing became a home, right? Not just a house. It became a family, not just familiar people. It became a blessing for the future, not just another tomorrow. James 1, verse 25. The one who looks intently at the perfect law of freedom and perseveres, will be blessed in everything he does. Those that learn perseverance, those that learn grace, not just in marriage, are blessed. I think I want my marriage blessed. I think you want your marriage to be blessed by God. Then you really need to think about what you just heard, that verse that we just read. The one who looks intently at the perfect law of freedom and perseveres, not forgetting what he has heard but putting it into practice, will be blessed. Okay? I know that this message has been kind of heavy. I know it has. So I want us to end with a poem. This is a poem that I found while I was studying for this message. Okay? And I think it's very, very apropos. It goes like this. It says, I've fallen in love and I don't know why. I've fallen in love with a girl with one eye. I knew from the start it was plain to see that this wonderful girl had an eye out for me. She's charming and witty and jolly and jocular, not what you'd expect from a girl who's monocular. 
of eyes at the moment. She hasn't full quota, but that doesn't change things for me one iota. It must be quite difficult if you're bereft, if your left eye is gone and your right eye is left, but she has made up her mind. She has made her decision. She, can't, she can see it quite clearly in 10, 20 vision. She'll not leave me waiting, not left in, a, in the lurch. Uh, if she looks slightly sideways, she'll always see me in church. I'll marry my true love who's gentle and kind and thus prove to everyone that love's not quite blind. Love isn't blind. It takes both eyes very wide open looking ahead at Christ. That's what we're all here for, right? To learn how to keep our eyes focused on Him. Then I really need to think, I really need you to think about what you just heard. I really need you to think, have your mind open to the Holy Spirit and His promptings. Maybe you heard something today that is really, you know, causing you to think about your relationship. Maybe you heard something today that maybe you've made mistakes in the past and you've got to really search for grace. You've got to really spend time with God. Maybe you've got some serious thinking to do about how you plan to be a husband or wife or how you're going to find another you know, spouse or what it means to even be married. Whatever it is, it's now your turn to respond. The ushers are going to come by in just a minute. Okay? Whatever you need to give to the Lord today, give it. Maybe it's a prayer request. Okay? Put it on the back of that keeping in touch card. Maybe it's a prayer request. Maybe it's a praise. Maybe it's an offering to him. Whatever it is, whatever it is, do not let it be nothing. Okay? This is your turn to respond to the word of God. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you again for your word. That even though we may have our own opinions about things, they do not matter. What matters is yours. We as a church will submit to your desires. Lord, give us the courage and the strength to do so. It means that we're going to have to make changes. It means that we're going to have to have serious talks with, the, with uh, maybe our spouses or maybe our, our uh, fiancés or maybe the people that we want to date. We're going to have to have, you know, whatever it is, Lord, I ask that we take it seriously. We take your word seriously and we really want to make a change. We don't want this just to be informational. We want your word to be transformational and that takes real courage. And Lord, we need your courage to make it happen. Lord, you know that there might be somebody here today that is struggling with understanding love, struggling with understanding that their job as a man or a job as a wife or a woman. The only way that we know that we're truly going to understand our, our purpose in you is by listening for the knock on our heart, opening the door, and allowing you to come in. Lord, if that means for the very first time that we repent of who we once were, they turn away from who we once were and desire to become who you want us to be, let our hearts be courageous enough to make that choice, to say, I'm done with the past and I'm ready for the future. Lord, I ask for your grace upon us that as we hear this final song, that we truly take a moment to listen to the Holy Spirit and respond in ways that maybe we never thought we would. And we pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Savior, I come quiet my soul. Remember Redemption's hill where your blood was spilled for my ransom. Everything
being led to the cross means taking a step towards his grace every single day. This does conclude our service for today, but I don't think it should ever conclude your desire to become more Christ-like every day. If you need prayer, there's going to be people in the back. They'd love to pray with you today. If you need to talk through some things, they'll be there to help you. But folks, next week, I look forward to talking about all those little, those little booger pickers and those virus uh, uh, little, th uh, little things called children that we've all been around. Let's talk about how to deal with God's children uh, as, as any stage of life. Okay? Love you. May God bless you. And I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs>